Did I say that right? Yes, sir. This individual is Jeremy DeWeet, a 41-year-old who is currently facing charges related to carrying a concealed firearm. The Orange County Sheriff's Office holds close knowledge of DeWitt's background and history. Oh, God. Not him again. Yeah. It's Jeremy. DeWitt's criminal record is stained by numerous previous arrests and a prior conviction for impersonating a police officer. DeWitt is the owner of a security firm that specializes in offering escort services for funeral convoys. However, it's crucial to highlight that he has a track record of misusing his company's services. He's been observed engaging in reckless driving through traffic, blocking intersections, and confronting other vehicles that he believes are blocking his funeral procession services. After an investigative period, law enforcement successfully detained DeWeet, resulting in charges being brought against him in two separate counties. The allegations include impersonation of an officer and failing to properly register as a sex offender. Initially, DeWeet was granted bail, but around 10 months later, officials located him once more. During an encounter with a deputy, DeWeet and one of his employees were stopped after the deputy noticed DeWeet carrying what seemed to be a handgun. Reach for that firearm. Walk away from your bike. Keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. Go down to your knees. Do not reach for that firearm. You're being secure because you're openly carrying a firearm. What? You're openly carrying a firearm. Florida law prohibits the open carrying of firearms. Following his arrest, DeWitt found himself in handcuffs. Subsequently, the deputy attempted to remove DeWitt's helmet, a move that DeWitt strongly resisted. Upon learning the reason for his arrest, DeWitt's emotions erupted and he became extremely angry. His frustration with the police was evident, and he appeared fixated on a specific issue. However, genuine law enforcement professionals did not approve or accommodate his demands. DeWitt was detained and transported to the police station, where he faced official charges related to carrying a concealed firearm. Nevertheless, further investigation revealed that the alleged weapon was, in fact, an unloaded pepperball pistol. Consequently, DeWitt's charges were ultimately dropped. Basically a Glock replica. Can you show me on here anywhere? I mean, I don't know why you'd have a light on a less lethal, but can you show me anywhere on here where it gives anybody the idea that this is not a firearm? I don't that, it, those. That, that it's a less Sorry, lethal? I can't answer that. I don't, I don't make those. But you know they're less lethal. No, no, no. I'm asking. I, 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 no, no, I, no, if no, I saw no. this, I wouldn't know that. That's where you're from. <clears throat> but you can save that for somebody else. Okay. How's it going, sir? Good. How are you? DeWitte's legal challenges, however, remain unresolved. Following his recent arrest, his existing bond was revoked. This necessitated DeWitte's appearance before a judge to seek clarification and address the situation. Honor, no, I was on bond. They revoked my bond with a new charge, but that charge was dropped. He has approximately 10 or 11 other cases that he's currently pursuing. Oh, you got a bunch of di different cases that are keeping him. Right. Ultimately, DeWitt was released from custody and his bond was reinstated. Nonetheless, he will still face a trial for the charge of impersonating a police officer. If found guilty, he could potentially be sentenced to up to five years in prison. I haven't been away from my kids for more than a day. And since being incarcerated, I miss Christmas, I miss my little Serena's birthday. I miss my Kylie at Rose Rider High School, which I was back. This individual is Sean Corder, a 35-year-old police officer serving with the Bloomfield Police Department. He is currently facing a range of charges, which include conspiracy to commit official misconduct, official misconduct, tampering with public records, falsifying public records, and false swearing. The incident in question took place on June 7, 2012, when Corder responded to a call at Marcus Jeter's residence following an argument between Jeter and his girlfriend. Jeter voluntarily left the premises, but Corder pursued him onto the Garden State Parkway and initiated a traffic stop. Despite Corder's efforts to have Jeter exit his vehicle, Jeter refused, expressing concerns about his safety. After requesting backup, other officers arrived at the scene, resulting in an unfortunate crash between their vehicle and the front of Jeter's car. In the midst of the situation, 
Corder proceeded to break the window of Jeter's car and, with assistance from his colleagues, forcibly removed Jeter from the vehicle. Following this incident, the officers involved filed police reports, alleging that Jeter had attempted to seize Corder's firearm and had also assaulted one of the backup officers. Based on these reports, Jeter was charged with escaping, resisting arrest, aggravated assault, and attempting to disarm a police officer. However, after the discovery of new evidence, the prosecutor decided to drop all charges against Marcus Jeter. Subsequently, an investigation was initiated into the actions of the officers involved, leading to their indictment by a grand jury. Prior to his sentencing, Officer Corder addressed the judge in the presence of the entire Essex County Courthouse, sharing his thoughts and statements regarding the case. I love my children more than anything in the world. And uh, I know they need me. I don't want them to have to suffer, switch schools, lose friends, lose the house that they're raised in. Marcus Jeter, the victim in this case, was also present in the courthouse and provided his perspective on Sean Corder and the entire situation. To say that I resisted, he had a choice. I'm not saying that that messes his character up. I'm not saying that he's not a good guy. I'm just saying that in a situation like this where he has a, an obligation, a moral obligation to tell the truth, he chose not to. Ultimately, Sean Corder, the former Bloomfield police officer, was found guilty of official misconduct and tampering with records. He received a five-year prison sentence from Essex County Superior Court Judge Michael Raven. This is the case of Lisette Gonzalez, a 46-year-old woman who found herself accused of driving under the influence in Sanford, Florida. The trial concluded with a guilty verdict delivered by the jury. However, just before the final judgment was to be rendered, Lisette's defense attorney made a final appeal to the judge. Despite Officer Wagner's claims that Lisette had tested above the legal limit, the attorney pointed out a crucial detail. Lisette had never been subjected to a breathalyzer or blood test, raising doubts about the accuracy of the charges against her. Respectfully ask that this court grant the judgment notwithstanding the verdict. In an unexpected turn of events within the courtroom, Lisette Gonzalez's defense counsel boldly requested that the judge overturn the guilty verdict delivered by the jury and declare Lisette innocent. This led to a heated dispute between the judge and the prosecution team, adding an air of tension and anticipation to the courtroom proceedings. Do you hear the uncontroverted testimony of this officer? Your Honor. Then I want you taking him up on perjury. Your Honor. Will you take him up for he perjury? Did, he admitted it was a mistake, Your Honor. No, but he lied. He lied on a sworn Absolutely citation. Absolutely not, Your Honor, and that is that is not true. I'm dismissing. I'm dismissing. I am. I, I am dismissing. I am dismissing this charge. Surprising everyone, the court made an unforeseen decision to dismiss the charges against the defendant. Instead, they issued a JOA, which stands for a Joint Operating Agreement suggesting an unexpected resolution. However, the judge's actions didn't end there. The unfolding events left both the legal teams and the audience intrigued about what would come next. How many times he basically tripped over himself just to arrest this lady with no real probable cause? You're done. Motion to JOA is granted. And you're not going to provide a written order on that? Nope. You want to appeal me? Lisette Gonzalez, the central figure in the legal proceedings, walked out of the courthouse relieved and unburdened by any charges. With the court's decision in her favor, she was now free from legal obligations and could begin to move forward with her life without the weight of the trial hanging over her. Nearly one month after he was sentenced in a racist attack in Nashville, Officer Michael Reynolds of the NYPD has resigned. News Channel 5's Matthew Torres has reaction from the victim's attorney who's disappointed it took this. This is Michael Reynolds, a police officer from New York City. According to court records, he arrived in Nashville on a Sunday morning in July 2018 and went on a three-night bachelor celebration escape with six other individuals, including two fellow officers from the New York City Police Force. However, approximately 18 hours into their stay, 
Officer Reynolds, found himself in a disturbing situation. Intoxicated and consumed by anger, he forcefully kicked open the door of a black woman's residence. His actions took an upsetting turn as he proceeded to threaten both the woman and her sons using racial slurs and abusive language. In the midst of his fury, he shockingly uttered the alarming words, I'll break every bone in your neck. Following this alarming incident, he swiftly retreated to his nearby Airbnb property, narrowly evading the law enforcement officers who were responding to the scene. I understand that he has claimed that this was an accident, but you cannot accidentally kick in somebody's door. You cannot accidentally threaten to break their necks. You cannot accidentally hurl racial slurs. A portion of the incident was captured on camera from a neighboring house. Reynolds entered a plea of not guilty in response to four charges originating from the incident. Later, he was sentenced to 15 days in prison along with three years of probation. Is to demand answers from the NYPD about why Michael Reynolds is still employed. Despite the outcome of his case, he continued to hold his position as a police officer, sparking a significant backlash against the New York Police Department. The incident ignited a wave of outrage, leading to more than 10,000 individuals signing an online petition that demanded his immediate dismissal. The petition also extended support and empathy to Kniez Halliburton, the woman whose home he had invaded. Daniel Horwitz, the legal representative for Kniez Halliburton, characterized Michael Reynolds as an individual with a tendency for violence and a concerning inclination toward racism. In an email statement, Horwitz emphasized that Reynolds should not be entrusted with a badge or a firearm due to his volatile and hazardous nature. Horwitz went on to highlight Ms. Halliburton's position, emphasizing that she firmly and strongly called upon the New York Police Department to quickly terminate Reynolds' employment. This demand was rooted in the goal of preventing any further harm that could arise from his actions. Weeks of mounting pressure and an online petition garnering 12,000 votes, even NBA star LeBron James weighing in on his sentencing with this tweet. While Horwitz likes the result, he still questions why the police department- A lot of people when police officers who lack impulse control and integrity uh, are on the force. The consequences for Officer Reynolds are substantial. Devorah Kay, the acting deputy commissioner for public information, clarified that he would not be eligible for a pension or health benefits. Moreover, he would be prohibited from carrying a pistol. Kay stressed the fact that Reynolds' actions stood in blatant contradiction to the principles and expectations that the New York City Police Department holds for its members. In court, Officer Reynolds expressed remorse and offered an apology. He explained that he had no recollection of the incident due to his heavy consumption of alcohol. Throughout his testimony, he repeatedly expressed his regrets, admitting his mistake, and acknowledging that he had consumed an excessive amount of alcohol. This is Lamar Thorpe. The city is currently dealing with heightened emotions due to the exposure of racist and homophobic text conversations among police officers. These disturbing exchanges were brought to light as part of a federal investigation and have triggered strong reactions within the community. I'm sick and tired of being attacked by these people in this community apologizing for the racism that is going on in this community. You're the problem. During a city council meeting, Antioch's mayor, Lamar Thorpe, engaged in a heated exchange with a resident, reflecting the intense emotions stirred up by the revelation of the offensive texts among police officers. Many community members expressed their anger and disappointment regarding the content of these messages. In response to the widespread outrage, Mayor Thorpe firmly committed to implementing significant changes in response to the situation. There's a lot of good officers uh, in the Anarch Police Department who work hard every day. I'm not going to uh, indict the entire organization. Uh, this is, and let's just be clear, this is unfortunate. The mayor has made a startling revelation. A total of 24 officers were implicated in the controversy. This creates a significant portion 
accounting for 20% of the police department who have been placed on leave in the wake of these distressing events. This is William Melendez, a former police officer from Michigan who was convicted of assaulting a black man during a routine traffic stop. Hands extended out of his driver's window. He was grabbed out, thrown to the ground, and struck 16 times in the head. The entire incident was captured by the officer's dashboard camera, providing unquestionable evidence of the events. When Judge Vonda Evans reviewed the footage, she was straightforward in her sentencing. I would have thought this. What crime did I commit? Being a black man in a Cadillac stopped for a minor traffic offense by a group of racist police officers looking to do a After hearing the defendant and his fellow officers joke about his injuries as they were wiping blood off their uniforms with disinfectant. 2015. Please be quiet in my court. Now, let's hear the perspective of the officer in question. And his family. I am truly sorry. Melendez was sentenced for his actions, receiving a prison term ranging from 13 months to a maximum of 10 years for his misconduct. The police chief was found guilty and received a sentence for his role in safeguarding drug shipments. Instead of upholding his duty to protect and serve, he chose to protect these illegal drug shipments. What's even more shocking is that he showed no remorse and openly declared that if given the opportunity, he would continue his unlawful activities. The trap of generous financial gains proved too tempting for him to abandon his criminal pursuits. Major developments in another big story we've been following for months. It was sentencing day for a former police chief. Donald Solomon told undercover agents he was the best cop money could buy, and now he's going to prison for it. Channel 11's Alan Jennings is live with the video that led to his conviction and the punishment that was handed down today. Alan. Got slammed, Vince. 11 years, three months. Stood before the judge and apologized to his children, the FBI, law enforcement in general, for violating his personal and public trust. The former East Washington police chief left the courthouse. His public defender attorney told him not to talk to me. U.S. Attorney David Hickton, meanwhile, called the 11-year sentence most appropriate. The videotapes showing actual drug transactions where he was using his uniform, his police car, and uh, operating in a fashion to protect the transaction and then escort uh, the perpetrators to Interstate 79 was beyond chilling. Here's that FBI surveillance video of then Police Chief Don Solomon meeting with who Solomon thought were drug dealers. They were actually FBI agents and FBI informants. Purchased law enforcement tasers for a purported drug dealer to use those tasers in collection activities. Uh, were shocking to say the least. During a year-long investigation, secretly shot FBI video also captured Solomon delivering his intentions to make thousands of dollars protecting cocaine dealers. And that's not all. There was another line that captured some attention where he was asked if he wanted to continue in this type of behavior and he said, hell yeah. Solomon took about $7,800 to protect the alleged drug dealers. He'll be sentenced to federal prison. He's going to be allowed to self-report, and he asked the court if he could take part in prison ministry when he gets there. When he gets out of prison, he'll be nearly 70 years old. This is Derek Chauvin, widely recognized as one of the most infamous police officers globally known for his involvement in the tragic death of George Floyd. The world was deeply shaken by this incident, in which Chauvin was found guilty of cold-heartedly murdering George Floyd. The horrifying event was captured on camera, as it occurred on May 25, 2020, when Chauvin used his knee to forcefully hold George's neck against the ground for a disturbing duration of nine and a half minutes. Throughout this ordeal, George pleaded, saying, I can't breathe. 
emphasizing the severity of the situation. You know that's bogus right now, bro. You know it's bogus. You can't even look at me like a man because you're a bum, bro. The video recording spread across the globe, leading to a wave of social justice protests. This brutal act of murder provoked a worldwide reflection on issues of police brutality and racism. Derek Chauvin faced charges of murder and was ultimately convicted on three counts, second degree unintentional murder, third degree murder, and second degree manslaughter. He received a prison sentence of 22 years and six months as a result. Based on the verdict of the jury, finding you guilty of unintentional second degree murder while committing a felony under Minnesota statute 609.19 subdivision two paren one, it is the judgment of the court that you now stand convicted of that offense. Pursuant to Minnesota statute uh, section 60904, counts two and three will remain unadjudicated as they are lesser offenses of count one. As sentence for count one, the court commits you to the custody of the Commissioner of Corrections for a period of 270 months, that's 270. That is a 10 year addition to the presumptive sentence of 150 months. This is based on your uh, abuse of a position of trust and authority and also the particular cruelty shown to George Floyd. You're granted credit for 199 days already served. Pay the mandatory surcharge of $78 to be paid from prison wages. You're prohibited from possessing firearms, ammunition, or explosives for the remainder of your life. Despite pleas for mercy from Chauvin's family, including his mother, Carolyn Pollenty, and Chauvin himself appealing his sentence, all such appeals were disregarded. The disgraced police officer is now destined to spend a significant portion of his remaining life behind bars. Three years after committing his atrocious crime, reports suggest that Chauvin's life has seen significant changes. He is visibly aged, with his once healthy and fit appearance now a thing of the past. Recent sightings indicate that Chauvin's hair has turned completely gray. Moreover, there are signs of physical deterioration, as he is described as pale and reportedly having gained a considerable amount of weight. Additionally, it appears that Chauvin may not be finding company among his fellow inmates, with one prisoner even suggesting that the best case scenario for the convicted officer would be to avoid frequent physical disputes. The disgraced police officer is now destined to spend a significant portion of his remaining life behind bars. Now at 5.30, it was sentencing day for a police officer who was convicted of attacking a male nurse at Jackson Memorial Hospital. That attack happened back in May of last year. That officer was fired for that incident. He had been with the Miami Police Force for more than 20 years. And now he has to pay the price for slamming the nurse to the ground. This is Lester Bonenblust, a 51-year-old individual who has been convicted of assaulting and aggressively throwing a male nurse to the ground at Jackson Memorial Hospital. His charges include violence against a person over 65 and false arrest. The incident took place following the discharge of Bonenblust's niece, who was dealing with mental health issues. Her father, seeking her readmission, was informed that she didn't meet the criteria for re-entry. In response, he contacted his brother, Bonenblust, who is also a law enforcement officer. Upon arriving at the hospital, Bonenblust was informed by a nurse that discussing the patient's issue in a public area was inappropriate and they moved to a quieter spot for privacy. However, Bonenblust turned aggressive, grabbing the nurse's jacket and throwing him to the ground. Surveillance footage revealed that Bonenblust had approached the nurse from behind. The nurse resisted and demanded that he let go. As a result of this incident, Bonenblust was terminated from his 20-year police career. Count one, battery on a person 65 years of age or older, and guilty on one count of false imprisonment. This is James Nicholson, a retired 66-year-old nurse who witnessed the heartbreaking incident. Nicholson, who had to leave his nursing career behind due to a knee injury, shared his perspective on the incident. To a point where I was yelling at the top of my lungs, help, help. What happened to me that day should not happen to anybody, especially a healthcare worker. When Miami-Dade County Judge Marissa Tinkler Mendez delivered the verdict, Bonenblust's family was overcome with emotion. The judgment decreed a 45-day imprisonment for Bonenblust, to be followed by three years of probation. In addition to these penalties, 
He is also required to complete 100 hours of community service. This is Michael Notoriano, a former police officer from St. Clair Shores, who has received a six-month jail sentence. This sentence is the outcome of his involvement in a violent conflict with a group of Detroit men who were alleged to have stolen his daughter's cell phone. The judge's ruling came with a strong message, marked by the severity of the sentence. Here's the context. Notoriano, a former St. Clair Shores police officer, faced a single misdemeanor charge in court at Frank Murphy. This followed a jury verdict that acquitted him of 10 other charges, including armed robbery and racial intimidation. There had been an expectation of probation during sentencing, but the judge had different plans in mind. We deeply regret this incident. Former St. Clair Shores police officer Mike Notoriano stood before Judge Kenny, prepared to offer an apology. All in this situation, um, not only uh, for myself and my family, but for uh, for all of those involved. Every single thing he's done as a police officer uh, exemplifies uh, everything we want. However, despite being a father and husband with a 20-year career in law enforcement, Mike Notoriano now faces a six-month term in Wayne County Jail. To be a deterrent to others who might think to act in that. Judge Kenny's decision serves as a clear protest, opposing the prosecution's recommendation of 18 months of probation. In the previous year, a jury rendered a verdict against Notoriano, finding him guilty of willful neglect of duty as a public official. This conviction came from an incident that occurred at a Sitco gas station in Detroit back in July 2013. During the incident, Notoriano, alongside Detroit Police Sergeant David Pomeroy, aimed a gun at two men and directed racial slurs at them. Photographs captured Pomeroy and Notoriano, both off-duty at the time, present at the scene. The men they confronted were alleged to have stolen Notoriano's 16-year-old daughter's cell phone. He's not the same man that he was on July 21st, 2013. While only the misdemeanor charge persisted, Notoriano's attorney argued that his actions from nearly three years ago were inconsistent with his character. Sentencing for the former police officer who shot and killed Corey Jones. However, when the prosecutor uncovered evidence of racial slurs made by Notoriano, including text messages found on his phone, Judge Kenny determined that prejudgment was indeed a defining aspect of Notoriano's character. As a result, the judge chose to hand down a jail sentence rather than choosing probation in the case. This is Newman Raja, a police officer who was found guilty of manslaughter by negligence and attempted first-degree murder with a firearm for the shooting death of Corey Jones, a 31-year-old musician and housing inspector. Jones tragically lost his life while waiting for assistance on the roadside with his broken down car. The incident received significant media coverage due to its association with a pattern of similar cases involving black individuals being killed by law enforcement officers. Corey Jones's loved ones expressed their grief and anger through heartfelt messages, conveying their sorrow over the ongoing acts of violence within their community. This should have never happened. My uncle should still be with us alone. During the trial, Prosecutors presented evidence that in the early hours of August 18, 2015, Newman Raja, while on duty but in plain clothes, encountered a seemingly abandoned car by the roadside. He engaged in a brief conversation with its occupant, Corey Jones, who was seeking assistance. Jones, legally carrying a purchased firearm, was then approached by Raja. Raja claimed that Jones aimed the pistol at him, while the prosecution argued that Raja fired as Jones attempted to flee. Within seconds of the initial interaction, Raja fired six shots, three of which struck and killed Jones. Following the trial, the court issued a statement sentencing Raja to 25 years in prison for each of the charges, manslaughter by negligence, and attempted first-degree murder with a firearm. These sentences would be served simultaneously. Count one, I hereby sentence him uh, to 25 years in the Department of Corrections. And on count two, I hereby sentence Mr. Raja to 25 years in the Department of Corrections. This is John Camfield, 
the individual responsible for a deeply upsetting incident in which he struck five children as they were making their way to their bus stop. Amidst the sorrow that circled this tragic situation, the family of one of the young victims, Jaheem Robertson, stepped forward to deliver a heartfelt plea. Within the courtroom, it was evident that Jaheem's parents were dealing with an immense sense of grief. Overcome by the weight of their loss, they eventually found the strength to break their silence, using their voices to convey the intense emotions they were experiencing. You don't know the pain that you have caused. Oh, my son was mowed down and, and killed by John Camfield, an ex-cop who chose to drink, to drink your sorrows away and then get behind the wheel. An investigation into the incident revealed a troubling detail about John Camfield's state. It's suspected that he was operating a vehicle with a blood alcohol level that was twice the legal limit when he struck the five students from Dundee Ridge Middle Academy who were walking near their designated bus stop. This upsetting discovery points to the fact that he was driving under the influence of alcohol during the time of this tragic event. They're screaming, saying, Daddy, help. In an unexpected turn of events, an off-duty officer associated with the Polk County Sheriff's Office, accompanied by his father, took it upon themselves to give chase to the suspect. Jonathan Quintana, one of the individuals caught up in this incident, vividly recalls the critical moment when Camfield's actions had devastating consequences. The impact of this tragic event, which claimed the lives of several young individuals, stirred up a wave of emotional emotions among those who were directly affected. Bye, s your daughter. Camfield has put forth an explanation for the incident, stating that he experienced a medical crisis at the time. He associates his blackout with a liver issue, implying that his health condition played a significant role in the unfolding of events. According to his account, his medical emergency was a contributing factor that led to the unfortunate series of actions. Of controlling the events that occurred on April 27th, I had not been drinking at all that day. The consequences of Camfield's actions have been severe. The judge, responding to the severity of the situation, made the decision to revoke his driver's license permanently. In addition to this, the potential legal outcome is even larger. Camfield faces the possibility of a life sentence in prison as a result of the actions he took on that fateful day. This is Charlie Reeder, the former sheriff of Pike County, who is facing several serious charges, including two counts of theft in office and tampering with evidence. In 2019, he was accused of diverting money obtained from drug confiscations to fuel his gambling addiction, which he had been struggling with for a significant period of time. It is suspected that he stole an amount of approximately $5,000. In an attempt to maintain his reputation, Reader claimed in court that he had taken the money from drug investigations and used it to benefit the community. However, this justification was highly questionable and it was difficult to believe his explanation. Just before his sentencing, Reader delivered an emotional speech with tears streaming down his face, pleading with the judge to spare him from a prison sentence. I stand here before you today to take accountability for the, my actions. As a sheriff of Ohio, I shed, <clears throat> excuse me, I shed bad light on the office of sheriff. Following the lengthy and emotionally charged speech, characterized by tears, a shaky voice, and various tactics employed to sway the judge's decision, the judge had only one question to pose. The denominations did not match what was taken at the crime scene or from those individuals. Uh, I guess, why did you take the money? As part of the plea agreement, Reeder has been barred from holding any public office in Ohio. Subsequently, the judge handed down a sentence of six and a half years. However, since the charges will be served simultaneously, Reeder is expected to serve three years in prison. This is David Oliver, a former police chief of Brimfield Township who faced four misdemeanor charges, unlawful restraint, attempted theft, simple assault, and unauthorized use of property. 
David gained some attention on social media for his straightforward and humorous remarks about the criminals he refers to as mops. However, his luck took a turn for the worse when the judge overseeing his case labeled him a mop during his sentencing, serving him a taste of his own medicine. From the mop that you wrote about in your book. David Oliver displayed clear signs of conflict as he entered a plea of no contest to multiple charges, including attempted theft while holding office and sexual assault. The allegations of sexual harassment were made by Crystal Casterline, a female officer who accused him of misconduct. That Crystal punched me as, as much as I punched her. During the court proceedings, Crystal Casterline, a former officer who served under David Oliver, bravely came forward and informed the judge that it was David Oliver himself who had subjected her to harassment. She expressed her dissatisfaction with the proposed plea agreement, stating that it was not sufficient as a form of punishment for his actions. Fun runner, I loved life. I snuggled my little girls constantly, and I was naive. I was naive. I never understood domestic violence, how it gets them. Oliver's anger became apparent, as he heard Casterline mention certain details. Hugs escalated to groping, me, trapping me places and forcing me into positions where he would press his body into mine, forcing me to dance with him. Despite his disagreement with numerous allegations, Oliver chose to plead guilty to all charges to put the past behind him and move on with his life. As a result, he received a sentence of two years of probation and was ordered to provide compensation. Furthermore, he was permanently barred from serving as a police officer ever again. This is Zachary Wester at his trial in Jackson County, Florida. He is a former sheriff's deputy facing charges of racketeering, fabricating evidence, false imprisonment, and possession of controlled substances. Wester is accused of planting drugs in several vehicles during random traffic stops resulting in the arrests of many drivers who denied ownership of the drugs. These arrests raised suspicion internally, leading to Wester's suspension in 2018. Three years later, the case finally went to trial, where Wester pleaded not guilty to all charges. The prosecution used the defendant's own body camera footage as evidence to support their argument in court. One of the individuals involved Stephen Van, who had a criminal record, had recently been released from jail when Wester allegedly discovered a substance in his car. Similar to the other drivers who testified, Van allowed the officer to search his car as he believed he had nothing to hide. During the trial, the jury was able to view the majority of the recorded traffic stops. However, it was discovered that some recordings had mysteriously vanished and were no longer available. Why in the world would that have been deleted? I wish I knew that answer. Interestingly, the body camera footage turned out to be the most compelling evidence for the prosecution, particularly in the case involving Teresa Odom. At first, the officer is very polite and even a bit playful. As Odom stands near the vehicle, Wester initiates the search. It is worth noting that as he gets ready to put on his gloves, there is a small item visible in his left hand. Prosecutors contend that Wester concealed a small bag of the substance in his palm, which he then suspected to have discovered alongside a spoon inside the vehicle. It's Odom. It is yogurt, sir. I know. Okay. It's how, yogurt. How about it's, this? Sir? That is not mine. No, sir. Okay. Now, the white small plastic baggie that was in that spoon that the deputy just showed you on this video, had you ever seen that before? No, sir. Was that in your car? No, sir. Regarding motive, the prosecution argues that the 28-year-old officer was ambitious and eager to advance to narcotics investigations as swiftly as he could. In contrast, Wester testified under oath that he never planted any drugs. After five days of testimony and numerous witnesses, 
The jury was tasked with delivering a verdict. If Wester is found guilty on all charges, he could face a life sentence in prison. Following seven hours of discussion, the jury returns with its verdict. The clerk proceeded to announce the verdicts for all 67 charges. Overall, the corrupt officer was convicted on 19 charges. The officer's convictions included instances of misconduct during the arrests of both Van and Teresa Odom. Out of the 12 drivers involved, 11 of them filed civil lawsuits against Wester. In July 2021, he received a prison sentence of 12 and a half years. This is Michael Amiot, the Euclid police officer, who has been convicted of assault in connection with a case dating back to 2017. Amiot's punishment was determined to be one year of probation, accompanied by a compulsory payment of a $1,000 fine towards court fees. Initially, the judge declared a 90-day prison term, which was subsequently suspended. It's important to note that this sentence belongs solely to the assault charge he faced. You need to be able to control folks. No doubt about that. There must be control. But uh, there's a limit to how that's done. About eight months ago, Michael Amiot was convicted of assault and violating the civil rights of Richard Hubbard during a traffic stop in 2017. The incident occurred when Hubbard was accused of resisting arrest after Amiot discovered he was driving with a suspended license. Disturbing video footage captured Amiot repeatedly slamming Hubbard's head onto the ground. Eventually, the charges against Hubbard were dropped, and the city agreed to settle with him for $450,000. Following a suspension lasting 45 days, the mayor of Euclid made the decision to terminate Amiot from the police force. However, an independent negotiator intervened and reinstated him a year later. Amiot's legal troubles began when he was arrested and charged in Euclid Municipal Court in August 2019. Originating from the investigated traffic stop, the trial unfortunately faced a two-year delay due to the impact of COVID-19. Eventually, in July 2022, he was criminally charged and found guilty of misdemeanor charges. Listen to your trainers, your prior instructors. I did listen to them but I, I do believe in this case, I believe the jury got it right. After the conclusive verdict, Officer Amiot shared his thoughts. Looking ahead, he expressed his confirmation for comprehensive training throughout the entire department. For or against use of force, everything I did on that day was based on my training and experience. In the meantime, Officer Amiot was designated to the Euclid Police Department's warrant unit. The department stated that his forthcoming role within the organization remains undecided at this time. This is Michael Sippel, found guilty of assault. A judge has rendered this ruling in a case involving a police officer. The charges are from an incident where he faced one count of assault for the dispute with Christopher Pate that occurred last May. This unfortunate event transpired when he mistakenly identified Pate as a wanted individual. There was no jury here. It was the judge who decided Sipple's fate. In a significant development, Judge Morse declared Officer Michael Sipple guilty of third-degree assault. As he reflected on the verdict, the judge highlighted the necessity of concentrating on the specific incident involving Officer Sipple, his fellow officer, and Christopher Pate on May 5, 2018. Along with the legal details that accompanied it, he made it clear that the case was not about determining the general use of force by police officers during arrests, as they are authorized to do so. Similarly, he highlighted that it was not about citizens having the right to resist arrest, as they do not. Following the judgment, both the prosecuting and defense sides revisited a key aspect of the case. The body camera footage, which served as crucial evidence in this matter. The most important piece of evidence in this case. I think everybody can uh, say that after seeing that footage. Sipple's lawyers shared that while they were aware that such an outcome was within the realm of possibility, both he and Sipple were taken aback by the judge's ruling.
We've got a fully executed plea document that provided in pertinent part that he was to serve 75 days in jail and he's going into jail today. This is Sheriff Todd Pate, who was caught not once, but twice driving under the influence and this time injuring another driver. On March 8, 2019, Sheriff Pete, aged 51, was arrested and charged with his second DUI after causing a crash that resulted in injury to another driver. An investigation uncovered that Pate had been stopped by an officer and released just before his arrest. The case was assigned to Special Judge Janet Crocker and Special Prosecutor Blake Chambers, and Pate was charged with nine counts, including first-degree assault, operating a motor vehicle under the influence, four counts of wanton endangerment, first and third degree criminal mischief, and leaving the scene of an accident. The citizens of Breckenridge County, Kentucky, started a petition and demanded the immediate resignation or removal of Sheriff Todd Pate from his office without any further compensation due to his numerous offenses. This is what they had to say. Sheriff Pate has repeatedly broken the law by driving under the influence of alcohol, endangering the lives of the public and himself, and tampering with evidence. His actions have breached the trust and confidence of the public, and he's neglected his duty and responsibility as a law enforcement officer. Moreover, Sheriff Pate has exhibited poor judgment and a lack of self-discipline and control, making him unfit to hold others accountable for their actions. He has violated his oath of office and does not reflect the values of our community, nor does he have the trust and respect of the people he serves. While we wish Sheriff Pate well in his future endeavors, we firmly believe that his immediate removal from the Sheriff's Department of Breckenridge County, Kentucky, is necessary for the safety and well-being of our community. Uh, is that your phone, Mr. Pate? Yes, it is. You need to put it away. Okay. I was just... A, need to put it away. Okay. It yeah. was already a bumpy start to Todd Pate's court hearing. Can I make somewhat of a statement? That's that, what is, I, that is a yes or Before the hearing, Pate expressed his willingness to accept a plea deal that would require 75 days of imprisonment with credit for time served. But this is where it gets interesting. Todd is a former sheriff, acting egotistic and almighty, but he's about to find out how the world looks different from the other side. He ended up serving only 29 days and paid an $800 fine. When I drank and drove, thank God I didn't kill anybody. But I want this court to know, I want the people to know, and I want the public to know that Todd Pate holds himself responsible for everything that he did. But it's hard for me to lay down and plead to felony charges that don't apply. So I think we are back, Mr. Pate, and, and probably should have, have stayed in the place where we started. Again, I wanted to give you an opportunity to have further discussions with your attorney. Uh, but I I'm think sorry, we're... I'm sorry, ma'am, for no, doing this. No, you don't this. have... I'm sorry for... What I, I need to... I think we're back to where we were before, is that is it your intention today to enter this guilty plea? I think we're at a yes or no place at that point. Let me say, let me say, can I say one more thing? I think everybody in this room wants this over with. And if I could address Blake, Blake, I hope you learn from this case. I'm not mad at you. I'm not in any way upset with you. Mr. Pate, not that it we matters. have reached that point now. Okay. It, this is either a yes or no. Are you going to enter your plea or not? <laughs> I guess everybody thinks it's funny. Certainly not the people who I think are, are here with you today, I Mr. Pate. No, they don't. I've broken everybody's heart. But it's hard for me when I see Mr. Chambers sitting over there smiling. Let me just plea and get it over with for everybody. Plead to something that I absolutely do not feel good about, but I don't want you to try to send me to the penitentiary for years and years. If you can sleep with it, I can sleep with it. Okay. And this is probably I think unusual, we're done. At this do point it. in time, I think we're done. And so let me tell you where I think we are today is that we have executed plea documents. I've already ruled at this point in time. We, we're done at this point in time other than setting this for further hearing as to whether or not uh, the Commonwealth can enforce this plea, whether or not the Commonwealth is going to, to choose to withdraw its plea offer, whether or not the Commonwealth can withdraw its plea, and then whether or not 
Mr. Uh, Mr. Pate can withdraw his plea. But at this point, we've got a fully executed plea document that provided in pertinent part that he was to serve 75 days in jail and he's going into jail today. This is Eric DeValconaire, a former police officer from Kansas City. His story took a dark turn when he was found guilty of the murder of a black man in 2019. The tragic incident unfolded as the victim was in the process of backing a pickup truck into his own garage. The court is further compelled to find beyond a reasonable doubt that when defendant shot and killed Cameron Lamb. On December 3rd, 2019, a fatal shooting occurred in Kansas City involving Eric DeValconaire and his partner. The incident began with a traffic situation with a red pickup truck. A police aircraft observed the truck entering a backyard driveway behind a house. Despite lacking a proper warrant, and while dressed in plain clothes with police vests, the officers entered the property with their weapons drawn. During this event, the victim, identified as Lamb, was in the process of slowly reversing the pickup truck down a ramp toward a basement garage. DeValconaire arrived on the scene with his partner positioned on Lamb's side of the vehicle, with a clear view of him. As events unfolded, the officers made an effort to halt Lamb's actions, although it remains uncertain if he was able to hear their instructions as outlined in the indictment. In a critical moment, DeValconaire took action, witnessing Lamb's left hand reaching for a pistol and subsequently aiming it at his partner. DeValconaire responded by discharging four shots toward Lamb. The situation had escalated rapidly, prompting DeValconaire to react based on the perceived threat. Eric DeValconaire received a sentence of nine years in total for all his charges. Big thanks to our viewers for joining the courtroom journey with us. Your interest in the stories of justice is what keeps our channel alive.